in the second video of the last and fourth module of uh, this uh, course, I wanted to actually get into the notion of the platform economy, which is a very much um, hot topic these days um, with much uh, happening, both uh, remarkable and uh, worrying, promising and uh, dangerous. So there's a lot of um, issues in many different directions and many possibilities, of course. Um, and so let me actually just get directly into that. And again, this is, uh, I entitled this uh, Platform Economy Contested Terrain and Grounds for Social Transformation. And as uh, some authors actually from the University of California in Berkeley have suggested, the platform, uh, and, it, and again, we're talking about online platforms here, websites, apps, similar exchange, places of exchange, uh, and they suggest, uh, Kenny and authors suggest that the platform is to this digital era what the factory was to the industrial era, both a symbol and an organizing mechanism. And of course, Cyrniak in his book on platform capitalism points out that the term platform itself serves as a sort of umbrella term as the functioning of advertising platforms is different, of course, from cloud platforms, industrial platforms, production platforms, and what he calls lean platforms. And each of these share uh, the, ex the existence of an online platform of some kind, an app, website, et cetera, acting as the central layer or hub facilitating interactions. Um, before delving deeper into issues such as platform capitalism or platform cooperativism, a term that was uh, uh, founded by, uh, coined by Nathan Schneider and uh, Trevor Scholz, uh, it may make sense to take a step back and generally outline a few central concepts of the platform economy. These include things like privacy, market power, information asymmetry, consent, and piecemeal work. And although I get into these in great detail in, uh, again, chapter 10, in the latter part of chapter 10 of the cooperative economy, uh, here I will have make, restrict my comments to a brief overview. So from a policy standpoint, regulations and practice in the status quo seems to suggest that privacy is viewed actually mostly as an instrumental good with consumers revealing their preferences endogenously, uh, endogenously according to the expected payoff. And this is just standard neoclassical theory. However, as Lynn and uh, other authors have pointed out, and in keeping with Polanyi's notion of fictitious commodities, Privacy may in fact be an intrinsic preference. Uh, the authors suggest the intrinsic preference is a utility primitive. It represents a cultural intuition not directly connected to the intended usage of data and persists regardless of the consumer's type relevant to this market. So again, back to this notion of co-determination, this would mean that there should be, or there is a norm to, of respecting privacy. Uh, not that this is uh, some, uh, you know, um, uh, exogenously given value that a preference that has a price. And if we have, a, again, an indifference curve and a utility function, we could find out where everyone's the sweet spot is, so to speak. So we can also at this point state that the reigning view of privacy is lodged in an ontologically individualistic viewpoint that actually disregards the emergent properties that I have discussed, you know, throughout these videos, of course, an individual's privacy uh, preferences may be meaningless in relation to a large web of users who are giving up a lot of information. So they might be revealing in practice what one individual is attempting to conceal. So again, this, this is one example of an emergent property of privacy. To the notion of platform capitalism, Cerniak actually says that in the 21st century, advanced capitalism came to be centered around uh, extracting and using a particular kind of raw material. And of course, that is data. And why is that? Cerniak suggests this is uh, for two reasons. Uh, firstly, the ever decreasing costs of information storage. Secondly, the competitive pressures of the market uh, and of particularly market forces uh, that uh, forces actually more firms into the fray to find ways to monetize data because otherwise other, others are going to be doing it. Uh, and again, this operates by network effects. These two factors create uh, and created the conditions for the emergence of what Cerniak calls platform capitalism. 
and he suggests that given the significant advantage of recording and using data and the competitive pressures of capitalism, it was perhaps inevitable that this raw material would come to represent a vast new resource that could be extracted from. What facilitated this transformation was the rise of the platform or digital infrastructure, as Cerniak suggests, that enabled two or more groups to interact, such as users and uh, uh, deliverers of certain services. Platforms increasingly mediate interactions between citizens and citizens, between citizens in their homes, between citizens in the marketplace, with billions of users on Facebook and other platforms, which are increasingly seen no longer as social for, but also as contexts for generating an income. <clears throat> uh, think about Airbnb or even OnlyFans. These platforms more often than not come with tools that enable their users to build their own products, services, and marketplaces. This is an enormous advantage, as Cerniak argues, as rather than having to build a marketplace from the ground up, a platform provides the basic infrastructure to mediate between different groups. This means that a platform, uh, according to Cerniak itself, uh, between users and as the ground, uh, it positions itself rather between users and as the ground upon which their activities occur. So it is both enabling interactions and it acts as the, so to speak, marketplace where these transactions occur. This means, according to Cerniak, that platforms are far more than internet companies or tech companies. I can also speak of first mover advantages and network effects and similar things that I've all mentioned throughout in passing. Um, and these are also very important uh, topics to which I may uh, return after uh, creating these basic videos to reflect the, uh, the outlines of my own research to come back and emphasize some of these, if these, um, these concepts more uh, fully. So look out for that. Um, and if you are interested in a, a video or a lecture on network effects and what those actually entail analytically, then maybe comment below or, or get in touch with me and maybe I can see if there is an interest there for that. The next topic I wanted to talk about is the notion uh, that I discussed called uh, the commodification of consent. And uh, in particular, in fascinating very recent research from Woods and Böhme, various higher order effects of data regulation policy are investigated. Uh, and these authors conclude that market competition among dominant coalitions, uh, I'll get to that in a moment, can actually lead to less than desirable outcomes. These include market concentration, deceptive behavior, entry barriers, and further erosion of uh, the non-economic basis of user data. The authors establish a theoretical model based on repeated game theory that shows that the increased costs to supply of explicit consent to the European Union Data Protection Guidelines, the EDPG, uh, leads inevitably to what the authors refer to as coalitions of consent which aggregate user con uh, consent from a number of different trackers and publishers. The authors point out that these increases, uh, that actually this increases the tendency for market concentration by benefiting large coalition and disadvantaging smart, small niche or newer entrants. Thus a policy designed to improve data protection and privacy may itself actually lead to an increase in concentration in the market for user data. This should again remind us of Polanyi's discussion of the various historical policies intended to insulate other fictitious commodities from the ravages of the market, many of which failed at this task and led to further inflammation of the root conflict. One of the factors Polanyi points out as a potential cause for the many harmful policies was the lack of inclusion of the most affected uh, stakeholders. Um, in a similar light, one of the consequences, uh, uh, excuse me, one of the questionable practices in the process of commodifying consent is the fact that the standards for internet advertising are actually developed by an industry group, the Internet Advertising Bureau or IAB. So again, this is a, in a sense self-regulation uh, where there is a questionable uh, uh, background uh, and ambitions and motivations and you know, an opportunity for what we've discussed moral hazard and similar such concepts. Next, I would like to uh, survey the concept of a lean platform and the related notion of entrepreneurial dependence. This is a concept that Cerniak discusses in his book, Platform Capitalism. 
And he says a lean platform is a platform that reduces its business interests to the core element of the platform economy, providing a marketplace. Other costs are outsourced to other platforms or to the users or workers themselves. Therefore, as Cerniak suggests, whereas firms once had to spend large amounts to invest in the computing equipment and expertise needed for their businesses, today startups have flourished because they can simply rent hardware and software from the cloud. As a result, Airbnb, Slack, Uber, and many other startups use Amazon Web Services, AWS. Uber further relies on Google for mapping, Twilio for texting, SendGrid for emailing, and Braintree for payments. It is a lean platform built on other platforms. These companies have also offloaded costs from their balance sheets and shifted them to their workers. Things like investment costs, which would be things like accommodations for Airbnb, vehicles for Uber and Lyft, maintenance costs, insurance costs, and depreciation costs. This renders the lean platforms assetless companies, as Cerniak argues. We might call them virtual platforms, he says. Yet the key is that they do, they do own the most important asset, the platform of software and data analytics. Lean platforms operate through a hyper-outsourced model whereby workers, workers are outsourced, fixed capital is outsourced, maintenance costs are outsourced, and training is outsourced. All that remains is a bare extractive minimum control over the platform that enables a monopoly rent to be gained, as Cerniak argues. In order to prevent lean platforms from becoming the workhouses of the platform economy, regulations need to catch up to the reality that for a growing sector of workers, the platform economy, and in particular, lean platforms account for a household's primary income. A legislative and institutional landscape reflecting these realities is highly desirable. Next, the concept of data uh, monopolies and envelopment. Um, Eisenman and other authors have introduced the concept of envelopment to describe an activity where a provider in one platform market can enter another platform market and combine its own functionality with that of the target in a multi-platform bundle that leverages shared user relationships. Envelopers capture market share by foreclosing an incumbent's access to users. In doing so, they harness the network effects that previously had protected the incumbent. Just as the first mover advantage renders much of entrepreneurship dependent on existing platforms and their rules, envelopment affords these platforms the additional benefit of leveraging their dominant positions uh, in existing markets in order to gain access to new revenue uh, and profit streams in new markets. Cerniak refers to Amazon in this slide, which extended its virtual monopoly in online sales into online streaming, web hosting, home electronics, and even organic groceries with the purchase of Whole Foods. Other platform conglomerates have done similar. Uber expanded into delivering food and Airbnb developed tools to allow services like tours and the like in its experience feature. Issues like Facebook's attempt to introduce a standalone currency named Libra point to the need for understanding the role of the platform economy in shaping our choices and in finding more transparent and coherent strategies to meet changing needs in a globalized world. Many of these solutions may defy traditional antitrust regulation in the fast paced moving platform economy and it might require more stringent exposed regulations to prevent abuse of power and an extreme accumulation of data and market power in a few hands. Uh, before moving on to the antitrust, I wanted to turn back again to the uh, notion of entrepreneurial dependence, which I never uh, uh, specifically defined. Of course, going back to these lean platforms like uh, Uber, uh, entrepreneurial dependence merely or task rabbit, uh, mechanical Turk, however you want to call them, uh, it often is the case that users depend on one or more of these platforms for their uh, main income source. And of course, the rhetoric by the platforms is often that these are just, uh, again, gigs, they're just uh, side jobs uh, where people are just, uh, you know, ad getting additional uh, cash uh, to uh, spend, you know, for whatever discretionary income. Now, if it is the case that many users and uh, of the service workers are 
and using these, uh, these platforms as their main source of income, there is a high risk and a high degree of entrepreneurial dependence. Um, and I do get into this in some of the case studies uh, that follow. Now back to this issue of antitrust. There is a growing awareness among global governments that the power of the largest players in the platform economy, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook is too great and that concerted action is required by states to curb the monopolistic behavior of these and similar firms. In this, there is a turn in legal jurisprudence concerning antitrust. Antitrust jurisprudence in recent decades has seen a shift away from antitrust to prevent monopolistic formations and focused instead on price competition and the achievement of consumer satisfaction. And this was in particular as a result of lobbying or an argument by the Chicago School of Economics, by uh, administrations like that of Ronald Reagan. Uh, and again, this, the idea was that uh, as long as there is price, uh, that there are good prices that consumers are happy and there's no need to interfere. However, of course, since the product of much of the platform economy data is more or less freely provided by users of applications and websites, there is no way to apply this pricing theory of, of antitrust regulation from traditional markets as Jin and Wagman uh, actually have observed. First, the data exacerbates the information asymmetry between firms and consumers. Second, users stand to both benefit and lose from the externalities that are associated with data processing and provision. But the specific pecuniary and non-pecuniary harms and benefits to users vis-a-vis -vis firms' data practices are often difficult to quantify. The authors continue. Third, the nature of data storage and usage raises new questions about property rights and data ownership, data portability and accessibility, data concentration and security, data-related disclosures and transparency, as well as privacy and the ease of data uh, de-anonymization. De this is, of course, when one is able to, on the basis of previously anonymized data, uh, put together uh, tidbits about uh, an individual's uh, character and their whereabouts and maybe their health and so on. More broadly, all of the classical market failures, asymmetric information, negative externalities, market power, and bounded rationality are potentially exacerbated or face new complications due to data, the authors argue. This requires states to both return to older theories uh, of regulation like those of the progressive era, which looked at cartels as something in and of itself harmful to the economic order, and search for new combinations of antitrust and consumer protection. And in many ways, the, comp the comparison to the progressive era of antitrust is just. The cartels of the progressive era were in industries like railroads and oil production with high infrastructural sunk costs. Much of the platform economy is also built on this high fixed cost, low to no marginal cost model. However, Contemporary antitrust policy must also look beyond that era and connect with concerns like the neo-abolitionist appeal reflected in notions like the moral economy and recognize a shift towards relational contracts in much of the contemporary economy. In other words, a new view is needed. Uh, next, I wanted to get into this notion, the relationship between data, labor, and patronage on the platform. And this is just to lead up to the next set of case studies. Uh, in consideration of the above discussion, I do wish it, uh, to um, present a series of case studies, as I just mentioned, seeking to contribute to the benefit uh, in the distinction between different types of entrepreneurship. I begin by presenting a number of individual case studies that demonstrate discrete effects of the above discussed issues or previously discussed issues relating to the present day organization of the platform economy. So these are just very much um, snippets, I, like newspaper clippings out of much larger case studies that I am, will not be able to do justice to, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, um, fully. And I do encourage those listeners and viewers who are interested in learning more about these individuals and these case studies to review chapter 10 of the cooperative economy to find out more. It is freely available as a PDF online. So I do encourage you to, to find it. And uh, I do have a link on my on the website 
econ.coop, and it should be under research or and or publications. So the first interview, uh, first case that I would like to review is uh, Felipe Martinez, who is uh, one of the founders of the Massachusetts Geek Workers uh, and also the Guild of uh, Drivers, actually, um, that was founded in Boston. And um, again, just taking a snippet out of these uh, interviews, I asked Felipe about his uh, relationship. He worked for Uber and Lyft and had many problems with those. Uh, and in fact, organized drivers at the Boston International Airport, uh, the, um, I think it's Logan. And um, in fact, uh, had some troubles. So regarding his idea that someone is watching him or surveilling him, Felipe actually responded that he does feel like he's being watched in particular, he suggested the algorithm is very, of, of Uber and Lyft is intransparent. In addition to this, Felipe is actually being subpoenaed by Uber and Lyft, uh, respective of an if efficient expedition in an ongoing proceeding in which he's being accused of being a union agent. Uh, he has not been deactivated by either Uber or Lyft, but has seen a decline in rides. So this is a evidence of punishment for labor unrest and in the negotiations resulting from um, disputes in the contractual relation amongst drivers and platform providers. Also his destination filter, which allows drivers to select preferred destinations for ride is for some reason he suggests not working. Speaking generally about the situation of drivers, he says that people are willing to talk that is voice complaints and grievances with the door shut but not when it's open. The pressure of organizing riders is not easy, he suggests. Uh, and one of the proudest moments was when he gave a speech during a Bernie, Bernie Sanders rally. Uh, next, the case of John who uh, worked for uh, both Lyft and DoorDash. Uh, when I asked about the issue of surveillance, John suggested that he fell into a trap with DoorDash where he started by accepting every single job. This attitude, he says, changed when he visited a Reddit subreddit dedicated to DoorDash drivers. And many of these exist, and I visited a number of them. They do offer some uh, mutual aid to those who you know, are in these positions. Uh, so if any drivers are watching this, I do recommend you check out these. Uh, there are Facebook groups, there are Reddit groups, there are a number of other of these types of self-help um, groups. Uh, of drivers helping drivers. The forum, uh, he said, is populated mainly by drivers and is filled with lots of negativity. He suggested John felt the forum was filled with anger. When asked to whom the anger was directed, he stated that it was generally directed towards DoorDash, although also towards the CEO, Tony Xu, and general frustration with the app. About this, John suggested even for him, the app frequently crashes and he has to restart the app at least one time per shift. The forum also featured much anger at DoorDash support and also people upset with others in their area with high turnover. So people are obviously not happy with this line of work. Some individuals on the forum supposedly have no sympathy, according to John. Much of the anger in the forum is apparently also directed at customers, especially those who tip poorly and or don't respond to calls. After reading through some of the content on the forum, John realized that he should have read the employment contract through thoroughly. As he says, I learned that I can't be punished for rejecting deliveries. John spoke of a learning process. He also remarked that once in a snowstorm, he got warned that his delivery is too late. While he has never been deactivated on either Lyft or DoorDash, he has heard of people being deactivated. Many are not entirely sure about the criteria for getting deactivated. While some reasons are clear, this is not always the case. The next individual is uh, Shade, who I have to reveal is actually my sister who worked for Uber Eats, uh, DoorDash and Grubhub. And uh, suggests that, that dashers frequently receive notifications if they are over the assigned time frame. Shade refers to these as dings. She says, it wasn't that I was being watched per se, because of course you are, you're doing everything on your mobile phone. I was more frustrated because you think to yourself, if you paid me more DoorDash, 
I wouldn't have to sit here and multi-app. That's when drivers are using two or more of these apps and trying to get orders from several. So for instance, you might be working for Grubhub and DoorDash at the same time and trying to get one order, perhaps Uber as well, and to see, you know, to make uh, ends meet. Uh, so I wouldn't have to sit here and multi-app and do two orders at the same time to try to make up for the money that you're not paying. So that pissed me off, uh, said Shade. It's frustrating when it's your only source of income and you're getting these little dings and you could be deactivated any minute and you don't know, especially if that's your main source of income. That's frustrating. On the other hand, with Grubhub, problems frequently occur because orders are mistakenly assigned to multiple people said Jade, so then you would get there and someone else has already picked up the same order. In such cases, Grubhub will pay the driver mistakenly sent if you call, but just the base pay, not the tip. Jade suggested she could make the most money by Uber Eats. Uh, customers on that app can tip after the fact. With other apps, this wasn't possible. Asked about her self-esteem working for such an app, Jade suggested that at, at her age, a lot of people are off to bigger and better things. So I did feel bad. It did kind of make me feel beneath other people when I was in the middle of the day going into restaurants and it got to the point for me, I wouldn't even really wear the paraphernalia, for instance, DoorDash shirts and bringing the DoorDash bag into the restaurant. Yeah, I was a little embarrassed. So that is the weird thing. When asked if the apps are ethical workplaces, Shade responded, no, there is lots of improvement necessary. For instance, she and her partner tried an experiment once where they each placed an order with the same restaurant for the same item via a delivery, a delivery app and got different delivery charges in the same household, which she said is not fair from a customer perspective. Asked which of the two statements is more true, I was happy working here or it pays the rent. She responded by saying it didn't even pay the rent and that she was just there to make money. The only perks were getting to meet other drivers and getting to make her own schedule. She did not feel lonely and observed that her partner brought his son on deliveries, which offered the opportunity to bond. She would not work there again unless I was in dire need. The next example is Union Cab in Madison, Wisconsin, which has a storied history uh, in the city of Madison, Wisconsin. And particularly, I wanted to focus on the interview I did with David Rosling, the CEO of Union Cab, uh, after and his statements after uh, the entry of Uber into Madison. So David suggested that uh, some more, more recent problems included a shrinking company, uh, excuse me, a shrinking community of supporters for Union Cab in many ways attributed to the influx of Uber. For example, Union Cab is not servicing many newer buildings where 20 to 30 year olds have abandoned the company. These are frequently tech workers drawn to Madison's booming tech scene. Many of these younger people have been wooed by the progressive image of Uber, whereas the reality appears different. When asked how the entry of Uber into the local market was affected, has affected business, David Rossling responded that it has strongly impacted business. Workers at Union Cab used to consider the company the big yellow family, but this has recently changed. Uber's entry has led to deprofessionalization and makes us feel less tied together, more replaceable. Working at Union Cab has become more of a job, less of a lifestyle. The change also reflects intangible aspects, things like medical transport, which was a big source of income for Union Cab and which has since been outsourced to companies like Logisticare. In order to survive in this new hostile environment, Union Cab is currently engaging in a number of efforts to restructure itself, including considering introducing a meritocratic pay system to replace the current seniority-based system. David Rosling is convinced such a system undermines solidarity and celebrates competition. It has further dismantled team management styles, falling back on more traditional managerial styles. The goal of the reform is to be more corporate, and this has created more principal agent relations, according to Rosling, and has led to less voice on the part of the members. When asked about notions of surveillance, Rosling reported that such uh, sentiments are increasing via the merit pay system. The culture has changed, she stated. In the past, Union Cab was a kind of public utility. We used to be responsible for getting drunks off the street. Police would ignore speeding by drivers and so on. Many of these policies disappeared after Uber entered the market. Hospitals, schools, and other anchor institutions stuck with us. When asked about the idea of forming a multi-stakeholder cooperative, Rosling responded that the idea has been discussed, 
but there is some fear. Nevertheless, steps towards a multi-stakeholder approach have been taken. As an example, Rossling listed the existence of some LLCs, that is limited liability companies, which Union Cab has as subsidiaries. One of these was recently converted into a public nonprofit providing wheelchair transport. So with these individual case studies out of the way, I actually wanted to now um, engage in, a, I think, a very interesting, uh, and these are very insightful uh, individuals who shared, you know, parts of their lives, uh, very intimate details with me. And uh, it was a, a very a flattering experience to, and gratifying experience to be able to speak uh, with them. But um, to integrate some of these experiences into uh, the more general framework uh, that I have outlined in these last uh, several modules and all these uh, lectures, I next wanted to reintroduce or introduce the cooperative principles uh, and have them interrogate the free and open source software principles that uh, have, were developed by, amongst others, the Debian Foundation and others. And uh, uh, the extensive discussion of these, this interrogation is actually in the dissertation in the book, uh, The Cooperative Economy, and I don't really uh, engage in, in the entirety of it here. Uh, so this is again, just a summary. And these uh, case studies that I've just reviewed demonstrate the difficulty in applying the cooperative principles as stated in the 1995 statement of identity to the nebulous and complex domain of the platform. In fact, notions like network effects as applied to social networks and platforms, as well as the idea of viewing data as a commodity were not yet prevalent at the last time the cooperative identity was updated. Thus, as much in the world has changed since 1995, there is a need to update the cooperative principles, which formally define the logic of cooperation within the economic realm, as I've argued in the past module. This changed status quo may entail an emendation, a change of the principles towards dealing more clearly with issues including increased interdependence, reliance on network effects, bundling, envelopment, and the ease with which much of modern intellectual property can be reproduced, often referred to as zero marginal cost. For instance, due to the ease with which data can be copied and reproduced, much of the platform economy exists in an environment reminiscent of the American frontier prior to the 20th century, described in a song by Woody Guthrie as pastures of plenty. In order to deal with the new type of interdependent networked and zero marginal cost IP, or intellectual property, the open source definition, a list of nine free and open source software or FOSS principles was developed by the open source initiative. These in turn were derived from the Debian free software guidelines and entail firstly, free redistribution. Secondly, inclusion of source code. Three, allowing for modification and derived works. Four, integrity of the author's source code as a compromise position. Uh, so, one can't just abuse the, the source code, one has to respect the, the work of others. Uh, fifthly, no discrimination against persons or groups. Sixth, no discrimination against fields of endeavor like commercial use. Seven, the license needs to apply to all to whom the program is redistributed. Eight, the license must not be specific to a product. And nine, the license must not restrict other software. So I will not recount the seven cooperative principles here because I do describe and analyze those in various videos in uh, the in uh, module number three in the prior module. So I recommend if you don't know those to look at the International Cooperative Alliance's uh, principles and values, which you can find online or to review those videos. So now I, or actually you can see them also in the cooperative economy. Uh, now I just move directly into this, uh, this interrogation and ask whether a synthesis is possible. It would appear from the cross-examination that I did conduct in the cooperative economy that there are fundamental isomorphisms or similarities uh, between the cooperative principles and the free and open source software principles. Uh, particularly, there's an example that I would like to use to illustrate that uh, those connections. And that is the 2004 tsunami in Sri Lanka, which demonstrates the benefit in combining free and open source software development and the principles of cooperation. 
in that case to use in rapidly and effectively dealing with a humanitarian crisis. Thus, immediately after the tsunami, responsible for upwards of 40,000 deaths in Sri Lanka, members of the Island Nations Information and Communication Technology, or ICT, community developed Sahana. Sahana's vision is to help alleviate human suffering and help save lives through the effective use of ICT, or information and computer technology, uh, communications technology, to help manage disaster coordination problems during a disaster. By 2007, this open source project was well in development and saw early implementation in New York City's storm preparedness programs. One of Sahana's early prominent applications came in the wake of the devastating 7.0 earthquake off the coast of Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince, in 2010. Less than 48 hours after the earthquake, a Sahana-based portal was created that allowed dozens of international, state, and non-state aid organizations to coordinate and communicate openly and easily. Those responsible for its development note, noted that the scale was the main pro that scale was the main problem with coordinating disaster relief. Actors in Sri Lanka found that though support is often forthcoming, coordination chaos ensures uh, ensues rather because each relief group on the scene has little idea what the other is actually doing. As a result, there is a waste of pledged support, imbalances in aid distribution, and a lack of proper coverage of support and services. Thus, Sahana demonstrates the practical efficacy with respect to relational rents, including speed, reliability, trust, transparency, and accessibility, how the logic of cooperation as manifest in the cooperative principles can be meaningfully combined with the free and open source software principles. Next, I would like to review a great uh, startling example of the, the, this combination as well, which is in Montreal and is called AVA. Uh, AVA is a uh, self-proclaimed ride share and delivery cooperative founded in 2007 in Montreal, Quebec. The motivation for the company was that by localizing mobility, economy, democratizing governance and decentralizing data management, the co-founders redefined the next generation of mobility. Moreover, it was thought that by bringing together riders and drivers as members, AVA could ensure a mutualistic relation with all the stakeholders involved and a better redistribution of wealth. The app launched in 2019 and has since become the second place rideshare app in Montreal in terms of riders behind Uber, but ahead of Lyft. AVA is a multi-stakeholder cooperative with about 50,000 users and about 3,000 drivers. Uh, as I had written the, uh, the dissertation, possibly it is more now. Uh, Dardan et Sophie, Eva's chief operating officer, considers Eva at root an app for getting from point A to point C with a possible stop at point B. That has since COVID integrated uh, food delivery functions. Isufi sees Uber as a shitty corporate citizen, but the service uh, that Uber offers is great. Uh, it's a quote. Thus, Eva seeks to adapt the service uh, that Uber offers with a more socially sustainable model in keeping with the two most pressing challenges of status quo, climate change and inequality. Thus, Uber is basically orchestrating its business model around the exploitation of its drivers, uh, says Isufi, citing Trebo Scholz's notion of drivers being overworked and underpaid. Moreover, phenomena like surge pricing, where companies like Uber and Lyft strategically raise prices at times where demand is high, undermines reliability for clients. All of this, so Isufi, leads to a stealing, not a sharing economy. In the face of this situation, Eva aims to improve the lives of its members with local and social responsible mobility for rider members. This means predetermined and cheaper prices. For driver members, this means more human service and better income. Part of this results from the fact that Eva charges no commission. Thus, Eva can be considered an easily scalable blockchain-based rideshare and delivery app whose goal is to develop neutral and transparent protocols governed by communities. With its franchising model, uh, and I should mention that there are two franchises, one in Ottawa and one in Quebec City, it can be thought of, uh, argues Isufi, as a McDonald's where we're basically franchising a Big Mac recipe which is the app to different local franchises. And the local franchises are locally managed by both drivers and riders. It's like we're a McDonald's owned by the workers and customers, says Isufi. 
the app, according to eSufi, is entirely based on a decentralized protocol using third generation blockchain technology. This allows the blockchain based ride share and delivery app to be easily scalable to various local contexts. And I should mention one of the contexts actually is New York City, where the Drivers Cooperative uh, exists and originally was started as a franchise of Eva and has since been covered by uh, the New York Times and other very prominent uh, newspapers. Since the app, of course, is owned by the members, it is not a middleman engaging in arbitrage. Thus, regarding Eva's multiple stakeholders using the app, Isufi suggested that one is asking for supply and the other one is asking for demand. And basically the app is a mutual tool for them to access the market they're looking for. The very open and transparent nature of organizing the technology enables us or enables Eva to allow public access to the database with inherent encryption of nominal data, allowing for Eva's movement to scale up and its application to be used in different cities. This increases the resilience and adaptability of the app and also enables cooperation with public authorities. As Dardan Isufi states, when there's a profit or a surplus, it is shared amongst the members. And of course, transparency with uh, the blockchain database, which is accessible to any municipal government or to tax agencies and others. Uh, the structure uh, is actually in two tiers, first being Ava Global, which develops the technology, the branding, quality assurance, and global marketing. The second tier are the cooperatives run as local franchises, for instance, Montreal, Ottawa, Quebec City, et cetera. These are members, member-owned companies that are responsible for local marketing, drivers, management, and operations. Since Avas ride share drivers are also delivery drivers, the cooperative takes advantage of Metcalf's law of network effect. This in many ways uh, mimics the business model of Uber, Facebook, and other platform giants who operate, for instance, via envelopment as described uh, in just a moment ago. As Isufi admits, since we've added the delivery service, we now fully understand why Uber is doing different services because it enables you to optimize your network. Customers have the app, which is really just a tool that is controlled by the members, by their code, uh, by their users rather. Um, in this tiered decentralized and member controlled structure, Eva is able to create a real thick collaborative economy, says uh, Dardan Isufi. Uh, just to mention one uh, case, uh, with, with speaking to dri the driver, Mar Martin Harrison. Martin, who worked uh, for eight years as a taxi driver and also worked for Uber, has worked uh, with Eva since its start in 2019. Comparing cab driving with Eva and again with Uber, Martin finds that while driving a cab is more of an adventure, people are nicer in an Eva because they don't feel extorted. He finds the fact that there is no surge pricing fair. Generally, he has a sense that people feel more like a person than an algorithm and that clients are generally happier when they are with Eva. They don't want to go back. When Uber came to Montreal, Martin first noted that Uber drivers were picking up all of his people. Thus, after a time of severely reduced fares, he went to Uber, which he described as being better than driving a rented cab for $390 a week. Moreover, he felt less harassed, for instance, by the police who Martin argues chased cab drivers for issues like speeding. He says he enjoyed the flexibility, although it is hard on the car. He suggests that the lowered fare rates uh, in November 2018, uh, which uh, Philip Martinez also in, in Massachusetts was, uh, uh, was campaigning against, also affected him and in particular that these changes were not communicated to the drivers, that Uber didn't bother talking with us, instead referring to vague language about the consumer getting a better deal. Thus, Martin suggests that Uber as a company does, does the minimum to make money and that he has a sense that they don't care about anyone but the shareholders and that it appeared to him to be a culture of greed. He suggests that he worked with Uber because you have to, with respect to Eva, for which Martin has been driving since the beginning in 2019, he says that they answer the phone and that he has even had the founders in his cab, that they are normal people. With respect to the benefits of the cooperative form, Martin states that to him, the concept is intangible, is not tangible, and that the difference 
to, to him relates to how I feel, that he feels more comfortable, more appreciated at EVA. In general, Uber's only concern is when we're on the app, that when I'm online, that's the business regarding issues of surveillance. Martin suggests that that was actually the attractive part compared to the relatively unregulated dangers of the taxi market. In fact, he suggested that he was always on the edge in a cab mentioning one incident in which two clients did not wish to pay and pulled out a six inch knife on him. The uh, next, uh, the example I wanted to mention and the very last one is uh, Poly Poly, which uh, again is part of the effort of redefining the parameters of public infrastructure with uh, respect to notions like entrepreneurial dependence. Uh, and of course this, redefinition extends necessarily to the domain of user data, uh, whose infrastructure is currently concentrated, like with the railroads, in the hands of companies like Facebook, Apple, Google, and Amazon. One remedy is to foster new collaborative models of data governance and management. For example, Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, introduced SOLID in 2016 in the wake of the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal discussed uh, actually, uh, which I discuss in the cooperative economy. Uh, Solid actually aims to radically change the way web applications work today, resulting in true data ownership as well as improved privacy. A number of promising organizations have emerged using Solid's decentralized architecture. Poly Poly, which employs Solid, claims to be the first trans-European data cooperative and functions by removing the platform monopoly's exclusive access to user data. The idea is like a union for data, allowing users to magnify their voices by dealing with their data privacy collectively, not individually. It aims to fill a gap in autonomous data governance as well as citizens become more aware of the need for privacy in the wake of scandals like Cambridge Analytica. Thus, Mercedes-Benz's uh, CDO, Sabine Scheunert, has argued that a decentralized data economy offers the customer full autonomous transparency and precisely this transparency is one of the principles that we at Mercedes-Benz have anchored in our data strategy. The idea for Poly Poly originated with CEO and founder Torsten Dittmer, who in 2014 became increasingly concerned with various developments in the data economy, such as increasing monopolization of data. As a social impact investor, he searched for firms to invest in that were dealing with the issue suitably, but could actually find none. Thus, after the Cambridge Analytica scandal, he decided to establish Poly Poly. The firm's mission involves traversing the dilemma of putting data in people's hands and at the same time, facilitating the innovation that companies access to data enables. Originally planned as a dual structure, it later evolved in a, into a tripart structure, uh, discuss, uh, which, I, which is a, actually there's a limited liability company, uh, a foundation and a cooperative. The foundation owns actually the licenses to all of the uh, to all of the intellectual property, and um, and is it is uh, licensed then to both the cooperative and the the limited liability company. The cooperative, in the end, deals with the users, and the limited liability company with uh, interactions with firms, and this allows the different interests to have their own representation and not a sort of uh, mixing and matching. Uh, that would necessarily create further dilemmas and ethical issues. Um, the uh, Poly Poly aims actually to inform its members about the, the use of their data uh, with in various apps and websites, uh, because the company is actually convinced that informed consent can only occur when such interactions are transparent. At the same time, it wants to allow users to have control over their data to these dual ends, PolyPoly Poly offers the PolyPod, a private server that securely stores data that only the user controls. Thus, the PolyPod allows the user to view which companies are accessing which data. In addition to this, users can give trusted companies and institutions permission to run algorithms on their PolyPod to gain anonymized data insights. Thus, the idea is for users to explore in order to gain knowledge with the ultimate goal of correcting but they do not agree to alienate or give up. One more comment on Poly Poly relates to the issue of trust. And uh, the company reviews trust as a context-dependent phenomenon, uh, according to 
uh, Christian Bugedai. Thus, while some people can combine social and technical aspects of trust, others are not accustomed to technology and are not so accustomed to establishing trust online. Generally, Bugadai observes that people assume that there is a social memory, i.e. that people develop a reputation by their interactions, but the concern is that on the internet, these memories go too far in the sense that they are frequently shared with third parties and so on. Thus, Polly Polly responds to this by building a system where people put their profile complete with the data that they agree to sharing onto the polypod, where firms then have to ask for the data. Bugadai argues that one of the primary motivators for Bali Poly is the need for a simplified system because people don't want to constantly manually give permissions to have others access their data. Thus, Bali Poly is convinced that such interactions should be able to be intuitive and respond to the profiles and behaviors of users automatically. Moreover, rendering such relationships explicit and transparent also allows users to be compensated for the usage of their data. Ugadai expects the average user to receive around 250 euros a month for data which today is utilized for free. So we see that most large platforms, including Airbnb, Uber, and DoorDash, live off of the commissions generated through access to the apps, which have come to dominate their respective sectors by a combination of venture capital, funding, and network effects. Thus, they receive up to 30% commission on price in prices in sectors with profit margins as low as 5%. Uh, in many cases, this leads to at best an amoral situation where companies are not respecting local regulations, for instance, taxi or hotel regulations, and just operating through this huge network effect. It also leads to a situation where discrete exchanges dominate with high turnover and evidence of strong moral crowding out. Uh, as the above case studies demonstrate. In each of these cases, we see that a translative hierarchy and coercive uh, choice mechanisms introduce many costs that prevent relational rents from developing. For example, Ruben Maya, one former Airbnb host, referred to his hosting on the platform as not a stable relationship, even suggesting he would never choose to stay in, Air in an Airbnb himself, despite being a host. This despite the fact that for years, he actually generated large income by the platform. Similarly, Uber driver Felipe Martinez's observation that he and other drivers didn't know what's going on with Uber's algorithm speaks to a lack of trust and transparency. Such circumstances speak for very low relational rents, which negatively affect motivation and decrease the duration of and willingness to cooperate. Therefore, John Sticker's observation that many drivers on the DoorDash drivers subreddit complained about high turnovers appears to serve as evidence of a very low relational rent in the domain of food delivery apps, where there are frequently few transaction-specific skills, but also low inter-stakeholder di dialogue. Thus, all Airbnb hosts spoken with reported communicating with Airbnb directly extremely rarely over periods of between five and 10 years of hosting on the platform. Given the fact that the suicide rate for taxi drivers in cities like New York is disproportionately high, this is clearly similar in the rideshare scene. I might also mention the decision by OnlyFans, a platform used by sex workers to remove explicit content from its site, which would have put the vast majority of its content creating users in a precarious position in terms of content creation. Thus, OnlyFans policy created an adverse environment for creators and did not reflect a perspective of shared value creation. However, instead of attributing such phenomena to Schumpeter's notion of Deklassierungsprozess, in which static and quasi-static economic subjects are swept aside in favor of dynamic leaders of, with new ideas, you may view the rising class of platform cooperatives as an endemic form of innovation where workers, users, community members, and other stakeholders, including local, regional, and or national governments, work towards turning the ambivalence we attributed uh, to technical innovation in uh, preceding mo modules towards innovations that increase the respective stakeholders' ability to cooperate. Thus, Eva COO Dardan Isufi stated that the corollary of innovation is disruption to which we must adapt and to which we must find a new solution. Thus, phenomena like the Reddit and Facebook groups discussed uh, previously can be seen as forms of innovation promoting social learning and collective agency. Platform cooperatives, their workers and their users are not static economic subjects, but are collectives, sometimes realized and sometimes potential, interested in innovating, learning, and developing routines, 
So uh, that facilitates shared value creation. This involves developing relational contracts with workers, users, municipalities, and other stakeholders. Thus, Fairbnb, a short-term rental platform that seeks to provide a more socially sustainable platform than Airbnb, has had some success in convincing the city of Barcelona, as well as municipalities in France, to support the platform as an alternative to the discrete model offered by Airbnb. Most hosts love the project, says President Emanuele De Carlo. Moreover, Dardan et Sophie of Eva concludes that the great thing about a cooperative model is that we're creating a digital cooperative by aligning it with our blockchain technology for the governance purposes and getting members involved in the process. Transparency can facilitate shared value creation by motivating the willingness to and duration of cooperation. Thus, Eva driver member Mahalia de la Cruz claims that with Uber, I never knew how much I was going to get. With Eva, it's clear, simple, and transparent. Similarly, as mentioned, PolyPoly Poly does not aim to totally block companies' access to user data, but to relationalize it within a dual cooperative and regulatory logic, thus facilitating a notion of shared value creation and likely increasing the quality of information users are willing to share, as well as the duration of cooperation. While platform cooperatives display many benefits, they also face decided costs with respect to their co corporate rivals, particularly their generally small size and lack of early capital injections via venture capital creates a chicken and egg problem, as Fairbnb's Emmanuel De Carlo has said. Thus, Fairbnb has had little success in convincing many municipalities like Venice to invest in mutual cooperation despite obvious mutual interests. Moreover, it expends much current effort in keeping hosts engaged, a problem rendered more difficult during the pandemic-induced decline in tourism worldwide. Nevertheless, as distinct from the motivation by the Airbnb hosts mentioned above or prior, most people on Fairbnb are here for identitarian reasons. They, they do it for ethics. Moreover, Italian law makes the conversion of worker cooperatives into multi-stakeholder cooperatives difficult, preventing a simple conversion of Fairbnb to a model where hosts and clients share in governance difficult. Nevertheless, the success of platforms like Eva shows that given a suitable legal and institutional framework and a combination of determination and technical expertise, a platform cooperative can present a successful and vibrant business model. Moreover, the upfront costs of developing such new models reduces as experience, including vicarious experience increases. Thus, Eva's model, as I have already mentioned, has successfully been adopted in New York City, where Drivers Cooperative has, was originally named Eva Drive New York City, which was created as a social franchise of Eva, which actually formed the initial team, grouping Eric Foreman and Ken Lewis, and subsequently Alyssa Orlando. Eva assisted them in their initial business plan, which included the launch, the crowdfunding, and much more. Uh, a last aside to Basque employment legislation, Aitor Bengotexia Alcorta, I am not sure if I said that name correctly, Basque names are notoriously difficult to pronounce, has observed the fact that uh, Aitor, I just call him, has observed the fact that Basque employment legislation is developed, has developed a unique category of associated labor that is neither dependent work nor self-employed work. Thus, employment in worker cooperatives revolves around the peculiar legal status of worker owners. The relationship uh, between the persons and their worker cooperative is corporate and the obligation to work arises from the corporate contract of each worker owner. So what we have are people with the dual status of joint owners of the worker cooperative on the basis of their capital contribution while being workers in it. This status is ontologically distinct from the traditional labor contract, which as discovered in the discussion of, chapter, of module two, uh, excuse, yes, module two, is based on a master-slave logic. Thus, it would appear that an entire domain of realizing the parameters of the political firm in whatever manifestation one would like is possible via creating new legal architectures like associated labor that immediately channel uh, labor towards an active role in the production process, circumventing the incidental and conditional development that occurs via the master-slave logic and traditional labor contracts. Such a legal architecture recognizes the autonomous, responsible, and creative agency of workers that is always de facto present and facilitates the shift towards relational contracting and such uh, is such in keeping 
with the long-term orientation and social innovation, investment in organizational stakeholders and in social sustainability, in that it facilitates increasing the ability, willingness and duration of cooperation, as I have argued in module three. Uh, to conclude this video, the outline of, uh, of chapter 10, which I have described in this and the prior video, has attempted to sketch out causal reasoning is a pow powerful tool that can be applied in a multitude of settings to provide confirming or disconfirming evidence of a particular theory or family of theories. In particular, I've tried to outline two research strands on the basis of which we may pursue such an agenda uh, as cooperative economists, the first focusing on contingent preference development and a particular form of social learning that I refer to as cooperative education, this research strand represented by the social learning in programs like the in leadership and innovation bachelor by a uh, traveling university and com at companies like VME, which I discuss in detail in the following chapter uh, and actually in the in the next set of videos after the uh, at, that immediately begin after this one. Um, focuses on the attainment of milestone towards stones towards aug augmenting feelings of self efficacy. I note the need to dynamically organize such experiences in a way equitably to equi equitably facilitate the development of leadership skills. This should involve the employment of blind breaks to eliminate the efficacy of human prejudices and discrimination, allocating some positions in a sociocratic circle by lot, randomly calling on students to increase engagement or organizing leadership teams by lot can push beyond both individual gaps in estimations of self-efficacy, pushing stakeholders to realize their potential and develop new skills, as it at the same time can break organizational inertia, facilitating a sense of camaraderie and a view of leadership as relation and function instead of as a role for charismatic personalities. Combining such attempts at relationalizing with a dissemination of cooperative principles can act to reinforce such transformational learning processes. Meanwhile, the second research agenda that I've outlined in this video actually focuses on particular implications of relational governance models. This agenda seeks to understand how shifts in states, in particular the state of membership in an organization, can improve upon relational rents, reduce costs of cooperation, and increase both the duration and willingness to cooperate. I further attempted to provide preliminary evidence in each of these research agendas in domains of high relevance, including in the low-skill service sector, education, and the platform economy. We've learned that social innovation occurs in the traditional platform sector with help with the self-help groups of dashers assisting each other in navigating the lean platforms. Nevertheless, the primary lessons appear to be that strong relational rents and moral crowding in a company of formal recognition of key stakeholders, whether workers, users, or others, in an organization's membership. On the basis of such research, new information on dignified labor can be elicited. This is important as both the International Labor Organization and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights emphasize the right to dignified labor. Developing a more coherent framework for specifying this concept further and filling it with qualitative content from a comparative international perspective would go a long way to strengthening a general theory of cooperation. In the next set of videos, I do reorient the focus to an ecological perspective, focusing on the interorganizational perspective, embracing a view that mission-oriented cooperation can be facilitated with the appropriate legal and institutional framework and a combination of vicarious learning and emulation of successful social innovations. I hope to see you there.